personality. Sir, can you give us some explanation? No, Lieutenant, I cannot. The captain may be mum, but we've got the lowdown on the final episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. Here's an exclusive first look at the Enterprise's last voyage. All hands brace for impact. Goodbye, Jean-Luc. All good things must come to an end. The crew's last TV trek airs the week of May 23rd. They partied last night where no party had ever gone before to celebrate the second generation of a classic television series. Here's the lowdown. For correctly answering such Star Trek The Next Generation trivia as how long was Scotty trapped in the transporter beam, 75 years, Trek fans Jim and Cinda Merritt won TV Guide's Star Trek trivia contest and a trip to Hollywood. When I went to my work, uh, they were saying, well, so, what kind of questions did you have to answer? And I rattled a couple off, and people said, well, you deserve to win. <laughs> you know? The Northern California couple beat out 300,000 other contest entries and were limoed to a premiere of the last Next Generation episode. And at a laser-lit post-screening party, they met cast members Michael Dorn, Gates McFadden, and Marina Sirtis. Well done. It was a Trek fan's fantasy. Oh, we had a wonderful time. Thank you, TV Thanks. Guide. Well, we're getting back to the party, too. Hi everybody, I think you'll be glad you're spending the next hour with us because we do have something special for you. I'm Lisa Gibbons. And I'm Bob Goen. Welcome to Entertainment Tonight this weekend. We're on the set of the movie Star Trek Generations. You can see they're in production right now behind us, blocking out a scene. And over the next hour, we are going to take you on a complete, no holds barred, all access tour of the Star Trek universe. It's going to be fun. You know, the, the huge Star Trek world encompasses movies and television and merchandising and, of course, a, a huge international fan following as well. And we're going to take you on a Trekkie tour, an exclusive behind the scenes look at the latest addition to the Star Trek universe. On the Paramount sound stages, crews are working double shifts day and night. A huge undertaking is at hand because on the horizon is the film Star Trek Generations. The other thing to do is to cut this out and make a bubble because the, the effects department can give us a clear bubble. In charge of creating the enormous sets that will take the cast of Star Trek The Next Generation to the big screen is production designer Herman Zimmerman. This particular script moves around so quickly. We are, we are in 37 interiors and seven exteriors in uh, a little under two hours. Zimmerman gave us an exclusive tour around the set, starting with the mammoth stellar cartography room. Approximate cost is $120,000. It's going to be used for exactly one day for one scene that'll probably be on the, on the screen, three minutes. Next came the Klingon ship. The dirtier, the grungier, the meaner they are, the better, the better it looks. Everything looks greasy and, and unkempt. At one point, two of these unkempt fellows stopped by to chat. You're my close-up. Uh, stop, <laughs> stop nibbling <laughs> on my ear. If you have to blow your nose, does the whole face just shoot across the room? No, no Actually, but the no. veins just pop out. Do they? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty intimidating. Many sets from the TV show will be in the movie, including the bridge here, but with much more detail added. When you view something on a 19-inch diagonal screen, um, it's very forgiving of detail, but when you see it on a 30-foot high, 70-foot wide cinemascope screen, you really need the detail. Star Trek is really an interesting vision of the future, and Starship Commander Patrick Stewart says it's a vision based on optimism. It tells us there's going to be a future, and that although the whole universe will not be improved, but in this solar system, we've actually finally got it right. Well, they're shooting to get Star Trek Generations into theaters by Thanksgiving. This move to the big <laughs> screen. Smoke. I think my pants are on fire. <laughs> <laughs> this represents a transition to the movies, of course, for a lot of the cast members from the TV series Star Trek The Next right. Generation. And just as the original crew and the, of the Starship Enterprise before them, the movie universe picks up where the TV galaxy leaves off. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Time it was, and what a time it was, it was. There was certainly an air of nostalgia in the room when the last uh, scene was shot. I feel bittersweet. I wish I knew why the show had been canceled. They are simply the grandest group of people I've ever known. 
And if I get close to working with people like this again, I'll be very lucky. The final voyage of the Enterprise on Star Trek The Next Generation brings with it a galaxy of emotion. After beaming into living rooms and around the world for seven seasons, the show and its stars say goodbye to TV with a special two-hour finale. Captain, what's wrong? I'm moving back and forth through time. The episode finds Captain Jean-Luc Picard time-traveling to the bridges of Enterprise's past and future. That meant the reincarnation of some dearly departed cast members. Sir, can you give us some explanation? My first reaction was, well, wait a minute, how? You know, it was all a dream, I was in the shower or something, you know? And the premature aging of others, including Commander Riker himself, Jonathan Frakes. I should be so lucky. Look, it's the only guy who got older and grew more hair. But Jonathan doesn't have a lot of natural wrinkles. Yes, oh. Mike! Did you get that? And we got little hair pieces that are going to fill in here, and fill in here, and then I've got my little freckle machine. We made it. This is actually the next day. I had a feeling you weren't going to listen to me. Stand by. But despite this quantum leaping through space and time, some things remain the same, like the snug spacewear crew member Marina Sirtis has spent seven seasons squeezing into. One of the things you have to be on Star Trek is uncomfortable in your costume. It adds character. This is the industrial strength Starfleet Regulation Brazier. My second favorite item, the men's support briefs. Because <laughs> of course the men can't have a VPL visible panty line. And I'm sure if you asked any of my fellow actors, they'd all say they wanted an extra large. But I believe that you are the finest crew in Starfleet. Ending the series only to begin a Star Trek feature film just days later has made facing this final frontier on TV a little easier for this close-knit cast, but only a little. I'm gonna miss the laughs. I'm gonna miss going on the bridge and uh, having your stomach hurt from laughing at the absurdity and the abuse that we heap on each other. <laughs> a lot of relief tinged with some sadness and some fantastic memories. That final two-hour episode of the series, Star Trek The Next Generation, will begin airing in syndication the week of Monday, May 23rd. All right, now stay with us, because when we come back, we're going to do a little time traveling through the years of the Star Trek universe. The inconsistencies are so compounded as to present a seemingly impossible phenomenon. The phenomenon began nearly 30 years ago. Quite illogical, but highly successful. A look back when we return. Report, Mr. Sulu. We're surrounded by Romulan vessels. Maximum of 10. Range, 50 to 100,000 kilometers. Engineering, this is the captain. I want full emergency power. Welcome back to our trekking tour. We're on the set of the movie Star Trek Generations. Thanks to the movies and to television, of course, the futuristic fictional world that is Star Trek mm -hmm. extends way beyond the 24th century. Tilt up the camera for a minute and take a look at this. Now, this is the engine room. This is a big deal because this is, this is supposed great. to be the source of all the power for the Starship Enterprise. Yeah, but the spark that ignited the Star Trek world happened uh, a mere 30 years ago, and it belonged to a very modest but very visionary man. Kirk here. Found something. What is it? I'd rather not put it on the speaker. It all started on September 8th, 1966. This futuristic TV show with a cast of relative unknowns was the brainchild of Gene Roddenberry. Perhaps one of the primary features of Star Trek that made it different from other shows was it believed that uh, humans are improving. They were vastly improved in the 23rd century and would continue. Captain, we're now leaving the neutral zone. Mm -hmm. Bearing into Romulan space. <laughs> Set in the 23rd century, the crew battled everything from aliens to tribbles in its journey through the galaxy. Critics were skeptical of the show at first, but cast members like Leonard Nimoy felt otherwise. What I thought was, this looks like it could be a steady job. That was, that was important. <laughs> I believe there's some hope for you after all, Mr. Spock. Three years and 79 episodes later, their mission was canceled, but the show found a new home in syndication where it began airing earlier in the day. So kids could watch it and uh, adults would watch it and it cut across all the demographic lines and it became popular uh, in its syndication. That newfound popularity transported Star Trek to a cult-like status and soon all the characters became household names and show lines turned into catchphrases. Fascinating. I'm a doctor, not a bricklayer. That is quite logical, Captain. 
In 1979, the series beamed onto the big screen. The whole cast reunited for the film, which was a hit at the box office. Star Trek, the motion picture, the first one, was supposed to be the only Star Trek uh, movie. That's why it was called the motion picture. But that made a ton of money. And so what, what that dictates is a sequel. Hang on! And one sequel led to another. Help us or die. I do not deserve to live. Fine, I'll kill you later. When it came time for Star Trek IV, we were lucky to have some scenes shot right outside our back door here at Paramount Studios. A set was built to film a crash landing in water, and the stars spent a lot of time getting wet. Each little drop of rain was like a, a sheet of ice. It really feels like you're in a real storm. Hardly did anyone believe that we would again be uh, working on Star Trek 18, 19, 20 years afterwards. Since then, two more films have been added, and today, Star Trek has come full Later circle to live once again on the small screen. The next generation was a ratings winner, as is the second series, Deep Space Nine. Both have carried on the tradition. I was skeptical about whether or not they could pull it off. Gee, how can they do it without us? You know? <laughs> well, they've managed very well, thank you very much. The world of Star Trek seems endless. There will always be new adventures and brave new worlds to explore, and what started out as a dream for its creator has become an American institution. I hoped people would like it. I hoped now and then over the years someone would say, I saw it and it was nice. That would have been great, but this is insanity. Let's see what's out there. When Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry was selling the idea of his TV show back in 1964, he was describing it as wagon train to the stars, which is kind of cool. Very. But it was uh, 1991 that he passed away, but the, the wagon train is still continuing to this day, as we know. It absolutely is. And, and I guess he didn't know at that time, but some of the biggest names in Hollywood's galaxy would be passengers on that intergalactic wagon. Do these faces look familiar? They should. They belong to movie stars, comedians, and athletes, all of whom have left their mark beyond the stars. Every time you feel love, it'll be different. Oscar winner Whoopi Goldberg was a frequent visitor on The Next Generation. Tending bar in the 10 Forward Lounge, she served up advice to the crew. This is one of the few shows that take place in the future that I saw as a kid where there were any black people. You know, Lieutenant Uhura was there. That gave me a lot of hope. This is Captain Morgan Bateson of the Federation Starship Bozeman. Can we render assistance? Kelsey Grammer and B.B. Newworth may have bellied up to the bar at Cheers, but they were energized to be in the next generation. And everybody knows Kirstie Alley's name, but back in 1982, she got her big break on the big screen in Star Trek II. It was great. It was my first job. I was very grateful, don't get me wrong, and I really wanted to do it. I and mean, I was thrilled when I got Star Trek, but I didn't know I'd be playing a Vulcan. Captain. I am Jono. For Chad Allen, Star Trek is 500 years away from his current duties on Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman. But that didn't keep him from enjoying his visit to the future. I did one episode. I've probably been recognized more for that one episode of Star Trek than anything else I've done. It won't be as bad as you think. Majkin Amick is best known for her role on Twin Peaks, but in 1989, she made her interstellar acting debut. She credits that voyage to her parents and the original series. I grew up with it. I mean, my parents had it on constantly. I had the bouffant hair and the tight suit and sort of reminded me of the original. Somebody had to keep an eye on you to make sure you still didn't find a way to cause trouble. And from a high-powered attorney on L.A. law to a highly advanced alien, Corbin Burnson made the transition look easy. I had a great time when I was there. I've always said to them I wanted to come back and do the character again, but I must have stunk up the scenery or something. Many of the named guest stars who've appeared on Star Trek say that they did it not so much for the exposure or for the money, but just for the heck of it and because it was fun. Well, yeah, they don't do it for the recognition because many times they're made up so much you don't know who they are anyway. From That's all right, the makeup. Yeah. When we come back, we're going to talk more about these high-tech facelifts in space. Don't go away. 
from Beam Me Up Scotty to morphing, find out the secrets to Star Trek special effects when we come back at warp speed, of course. Welcome back, everybody, to the set of Star Trek. Uh, this is going to be, I think, the stellar cartography room when it's done. Okay. It's obviously it had a little work to do yet, but all this behind us is going to be a map of the galaxy, apparently. Wow. It gives you an idea of all the, the fun stuff that goes on in the Star Trek world. I think part of the allure, of course, of Star Trek is the, the gee whiz element that's involved. You can be beamed up, or you can travel at warp speed, or you can just kind of kick back and enjoy a good old Vulcan mind meld at times. Right, yes, <laughs> I know you do every now and then. <laughs> Kills a Saturday. I yeah. can't wait to see what this looks like in the movie. Yeah, it's going to be nice. You're right, though. All that sci-fi, high-tech whistles and bells, that's what the fans really love. Right. And those things are the works of the real wizards in Star Trek's galaxy, the Hollywood special effects artists. <laughs> From intergalactic battles to shape-shifting aliens, transporter beams to time-space anomalies, the wondrous visual effects created for Star Trek are the work of a dedicated team of professionals. With an average of 60 effects taking place in any given current Star Trek episode, a wide range of movie-making magic is needed. Okay, pivot around uh, counterclockwise. The eagle has landed. To create those realistic images of starships in flight, highly detailed miniatures are first mounted, lit, and choreographed to perform a celestial ballet with a computer-controlled camera. Dan Curry is the show's visual effects producer. So this shot's going to be five seconds, and by the time we, we complete all the work, it'll probably have 150 man hours. After several passes are shot and a star field added, the composited finished product appears seamless. Scenes that involve cast members are a whole different story. Watch how this scene on the bridge looks before it's composited. Other realities are emerging into our own. And now after. Other realities are emerging into our own. Some of the other realities on Star Trek are created with blue screen photography and also with computer animation. You have 30 frames a second and you literally illustrate every single frame. But while Star Trek special effects have come a long way from the show's early days, its technical wizards still have some very old tricks up their sleeves. For instance, this molten bubbling sun is actually oatmeal on a light table. And this stellar magma, it's just salt poured on a bowling ball and filmed upside down. But whatever the technology, whether high tech or low, these master illusionists make visiting the final frontier all the more worthwhile. It creates the setting for the dream. It, it does, it makes it a reality, I think. There's so much happening in that whole field of special effects and the technological right. advancements that are occurring are really perfect for Star Trek yep. because every year it seems that the space traveler's adventures become more and more spectacular. Absolutely. And the same is true with the, uh, the makeup artists on the Star Trek set. Mm -hmm. And some of the hippest people on the planet are the Ferengues. Oh. Uh, you know them. And we sent Leanza Cornette to sort of join their ranks. Okay, so everyone told me that when I moved out to Hollywood, I would probably change a lot. You know, my attitude, <sighs> the way that I dress, the way that I behave. <laughs> well, the changing starts right now. My mission here at Deep Space Nine seemed simple. Infiltrate the Ferengi ranks for a guest spot on the show. This is going to be me, huh? Yes, it is. Didn't I ever tell you that it kind of resembles kind of a butt thing? Oh, um, something we don't talk about here. Now, what is this actually made of? This is a foamed latex that's whipped up and injected into a mold, and then it's stuck in a large oven down on stage 10 <laughs> and uh, baked for about, oh, three and a half hours or so. Wow. And, they um, make pizzas down there, too? Yes. Good thing they put little holes in there for me to breathe. Mm-hmm. I just picked those out so <laughs> you could breathe. So you've been picking my nose. Yes. <laughs> I started to feel like I was fitting in when I got the Ferengi seal of approval from actor Armin Shimmerman, better known as Quark. So oh, great. 
I just can't imagine sitting and doing this like on a day-to-day -day basis like you have to do. Oh, it's nothing. I and you just kind of walk around like it's no big deal. It's like just, you're you just know, totally comfortable Well, with when it. they gave me the part, I had plastic surgery done. I really don't have to oh, do yeah. Oh, good, good. <laughs> okay, I'm ready to go. My big television Star Trek Deep Space Nine debut. Stand by for rehearsal, folks. As they come out, you will cross in okay. against them. It's a big moment. I'm walking to the door. <laughs> Luckily, I don't have any lines. I can play them if I did. Action. What did who say? Commander Sisko about my idea. In between takes, there were tips on Ferengi behavior from yeah. Armin. Now, when you're in pain, you yeah. have a certain sound you have to make. Repeat after me. Okay. Ready? and encounters with other alien life forms as well. It's eh? <laughs> well, I'll, uh, I'll be keeping my eye on you. And I'll be keeping mine on you. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, three hours of makeup for my big 15 seconds on the TV screen, but it was all worth it. I had a great time. So from outside the wormhole, Leanza Cornette, Entertainment Tonight. Thanks a lot, Leanza. You know, before Leanza joined Entertainment Tonight, she was the reigning Miss America yes, of I know. 1993. I just, I'm just trying to picture that moment during the interview portion of the pageant when they said, uh, what are your plans for the future? And yeah. she says, well, one day I hope to be a proud member of the Ferengi Alliance. <laughs> you know? Yeah, she says that and they say, I think you need the Miss Universe pageant. Right? <laughs> That's right. Yes. Hope you're going to stay with us because when we come back, we'll show you what happens when Star Trek fan worship turns into fanaticism. We'll be right back. Klingon is a warrior. It is the only thing to be. Star Trek fans may be the most loyal in the galaxy. We'll transport you to their world, which is a little out of this world, next. Welcome back to our special edition of Entertainment Tonight. I'm Lisa Givens. And I'm Bob Gowen. And this, of course, is a place that's familiar to all Trekkies, Trekkers, everybody <laughs> who watches television, <laughs> right. actually. This is the bridge, the place from which all the commands are given. And you see these people working around in the background. They're actually just putting on a few finishing touches, spiffing it up for the movie. Exactly. Now, uh, these are very nice people here, but you know the creatures who inhabit the world of Star Trek, they're pretty odd, and some odd characters come, of course, out of the minds of the Star Trek writers. Well, there are no creatures who are more colorful, more unique, more passionate than the ones who are allowed to really roam freely over this great Earth of ours. They, of course, the Star Trek fans. ET Log, Stardate 318-94.2. We've encountered a most unusual phenomenon that appears to be widespread on Earth. Countless thousands of ordinarily sane, well-adjusted individuals transform themselves into futuristic intergalactic beings and then convene to share information and exchange goods. Investigation commencing immediately. Well, you get the picture. We're talking, of course, about Star Trek conventions, those sanctuaries where celestial daydreams are played out and the future is now. For many, it's a chance to be a member of Starfleet. I'm a member of Starfleet International, with the ship USS Atreides up in San Francisco, and um, I'm the ship's counselor. I'm a Bajoran tail by the nose, and um, I'm wearing a Starfleet uniform, so I'm um, Ensign Rowe. But not everyone fancies a career working for the Federation. Starfleet. Klingon is a warrior. They're the only thing to be. Star Trek fans, whether they call themselves Trekkies or the more recently coined Trekker, also come to conventions so as to have close encounters with cast members. They personify what the, I think the human being should be all around. Of course, Star Trek merchandise is another big draw at conventions, and what a universe it is. There are guidebooks for the armchair warriors, phasers for the more active types, tricorders for the scientific, posters, plates, pins, and more accessories than you could shake a Romulan death stick at. These are Star Trek checks. They are uh, accepted throughout the galaxy. And those Star Trek checks can also be used to buy plenty of new Star Trek merchandise that is just now making its way into stores. <laughs> For the younger recruits who like to feel they're on the bridge of the Enterprise, a brand new interactive game by Nintendo has just hit the streets. You watch it and you see that you see the people playing it, but you control it. And it's amazing how they do that. But wait, there's more. Captain, I am detecting an intruder. From talking lunchboxes to Borg banks, frisbees to yo-yos, classic Star Trek to Deep Space Nine, 
The plethora of merchandise out there is mind-numbing. As for what may lie ahead, who knows? The possibilities are as endless as space itself. The only certainty is that the Star Trek fan, ever eager, will be the first in line to buy. Boy, would Trekkies kill to be sitting where we're sitting right now? So jealous. Right here on the bridge. You know, I was here late at night one time, bowling balls came out of this thing. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. You know, at that last convention that we were telling you about, 15,000 Star Trek fans showed up for that thing. This, they're huge. All right, I'm not surprised. And the fans are so loyal. Yeah. But let's say you are a, a Star Trek fan, and you do go to the conventions. Right. And you buy all the merchandise. Mm -hmm. And you've seen all the TV shows and the yes. movies, and you know the dialogue. <laughs> What's and left? And you still don't have enough for your obsession. <laughs> yeah. What do you do? I don't know. You go to Klingon camp. And that's exactly where we sent Michael Scott. Early morning at summer camp, a babbling brook, the raising of the flag, and a spirited rendition of the national anthem. That would be the Klingon national anthem. It's all part of the day here at Camp Klingon in Red Lake Falls, Minnesota. Eager followers of this hard-headed intergalactic race traveled here to bone up on their Klingon language skills. But before class got started, I was invited to take part in a little toast. Now, wait a minute, what is this, dishwasher liquid or what Romulan is ale. Romulan ale. I was losing the head on it. You took drink. <laughs> Talking to some of the campers, I found they take Klingonese very seriously. I was at work, and I was going, no, da, go, da, and they were going, do you know how to speak? I was going, I have no idea what I just said. <laughs> well, what you just said, you can die for now. Now, take the blade of your hand and bounce it against your Adam's apple and go Instructing campers in the ABCs of Klingon was linguistics professor Lawrence Schoen, who said he hopes they come away learning more than just the 21 consonants and five vowels of the Klingon language. In the sort of insidious way, we're tricking them into learning a little bit. So we're having a good time, and there's also some education going on. Captain, give me a good word with a capital Q. Which, of course, means? Good, to be good. Other phrases were also popular. What are you learning? Uh, how to say I killed you and you <laughs> kill me and just regular useful Klingon terms. Campers even practiced their language skills while taking part in the national pastime. What's that mean? Strike one. Strike one, okay. <laughs> so now this piece of Minnesota is under Klingon domination. Now for the sake of interplanetary goodwill, we wish the Klingons good luck but not too much luck. Kapla! Good job, human! Thank you. Michael Scott, Entertainment Tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks a lot, Michael. And I personally would just like to add, Nukta Wakwij Vilamka Chokwak. What does that mean? Is that really something? Yes, it means, where do I get my shoes shined? <laughs> oh, good! <laughs> good, yeah. you never know when you may need that in Got space travel. Handy Klingon pocket dictionary. I'll loan it to you. Perfect, I'll borrow it soon. Don't go away. When we come back, we are going to meet the man who is probably most synonymous with the success of Star Trek. Stand by, Mr. Sulu. Spock has something. He loves being Captain Kirk, but William Shatner has a more down-to-earth passion as well. That story next. I think it's interesting to watch the evolution of William Shatner. He started yeah. as an actor, of course, and became synonymous, really, with Star Trek. And now his tech war novels are huge. Absolutely, yeah. And it's all part of the global appeal of the Star Trek universe. I mean, whether you speak Swedish or Swahili or Cantonese or Cambodian, anybody can be a Trekkie. Audiences can see it in Zimbabwe, Liechtenstein, and Sri Lanka. The three Star Trek TV series really have intergalactic appeal, and we bet you never knew Captain Kirk and Captain Picard were so linguistically gifted. Les manuels sont disponibles pour tout le monde. It's a hit in France and in Italy. Ammetterà data che il compito affidatoci dalla flotta stellare è difficile. Big Mordes? Wieso ist er dann auf freiem Fuß? And Trekkies also love these shows in German and Spanish. Así que le agradeceré vista su uniforme. Pero me quité el uniforme por ti, Data. Uh, what was that again? So, you should get into uniform. But I got out of my uniform for you, Data. In Japan, the fan mania is at fever pitch. Wedding fever, that is. 
Listen carefully and you'll even hear the movie title Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country worked into this couple's vows. At this Japanese production facility, actors are dubbing the star's voices. Now watch how they react to this collision scene. And check out how the children's tune Frere Jacques gets translated in this scene as Captain Picard tries to help a bunch of frightened kids up a steep ladder. Then there's this London pub. It's new this year, and if you drop by, get ready for Star Trek Overload. There's Romulan Ale at the bar, pinball games, and different TV episodes screen nightly. It's also a smash hit. I had some upsetting phone calls. A little seven-year-old boy phoned me up, wanted to come down, but of course licensing laws don't allow a seven-year-old in a pub in England. And he burst into tears on me, and I felt rather sad about that one. <laughs> I came in with my son, who asked me to come. Well, she's my mom. I wanted to bring her along. This guy stopped in, not realizing it was a theme bar. Well, I just finished work, and I came in for a pint, so beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> Star Trek The Next Generation is on the air in 66 countries worldwide. It is incredible. Amazing. You don't want to leave us now because when we come back, we're going to spend a little time with a guy named Worf. <laughs> Boy, Michael is a good actor, isn't he? Yeah, nice he guy. Is something. Yeah, and what a performance with all that makeup on. Well, we have uh, kind of wound our way through this circuitous maze that is the Star Trek set. We found our way into sick bay here. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you've, you see all these, they have these little stickers on everything here. Yeah. The graphics department trying to add authenticity to the set. But if you look very carefully, look, one of the secrets of showbiz, this is the optical data net service access. But in the small print, it says, just sit right back and you'll hear a tale a tale of a faithful, faithful trip. trip that started <laughs> from this tropic board aboard this tiny ship. I think the graphics guys got bored one day yeah, and they're like, just having you know, fun. High tech, sort of medical data all no, around. No, it's showbiz. One it's of them finest. over here has uh, movie lines and their lyrics from a song. Yeah. It's real insight stuff. They're having fun. Yeah. But you were talking about Michael. He is a good actor and yeah. a, a nice guy. Not only that, but he's one of the really important leading men in Star Trek history. Right. And I guess people have had the tendency to think that all that space traveling and world conquering was pretty much a macho thing, a male domain. It's not? Well, the women, <laughs> as you know, have certainly evolved and come a long way. Fire six photon torpedoes across Jassad's bow. We only have six photons, Major. We're not going to win this battle with torpedoes, Chief. I say. Times certainly have changed a lot for the women of Star Trek. When the show first premiered in 1966, you would never have seen a woman taking command of the Enterprise. As a matter of fact, when one, two, and three in, in command went off the ship, uh, they would have a male ensign take over the ship before they had Uhura, who was uh, a lieutenant at the time. Captain, that's the old Morse code call signal. Thank you, Lieutenant. CQ? CQ. We're reading it, Lieutenant. But by the time Star Trek The Next Generation came along, the roles for women had become much stronger. Well, I can heal it, of course. The ship's doctor is now a woman. I'm very happy that I play a character who is a very good, strong role model for young women. But both Marina and I have had to fight to get even more out of our characters because even in the 24th century, there still are uh, sexist things going on. But Marina Sirtis, who plays the ship's counselor, feels her character wields a lot of power. She is the only person who really ever tells the captain off, who has the freedom to walk into his ready room and say, hey, sit down and just listen to what the deal is right now. And now there are the women of Deep Space Nine, who are proud of their roots, but can't help being amused by their predecessors. They had go-go boots and short skirts on. Let's face it, that's... <laughs> what, like, bright pink lipstick. The fact that the women in the show are very strong, very powerful, and that's what I really love about this. Well, perhaps we could discuss these new rules over a drink. <laughs> if you don't take that hand off my hip, you'll never be able to raise a glass with it again. Now, I really think the final frontier should be a female captain for the Enterprise. Don't you? Why not? Yes. Yeah, I could get you another job. Yeah, right. <laughs> Just what you I'm need. dressed for it. <laughs> <That's right. laughs>